Good evening, I'm Michael Popa, Executive Director of Mainstream Coalition. On behalf of our board, committees, and staff, thank you for joining us tonight. With a special thank you to our members, your engagement and support furthers our work to empower informed participation and meaningful action in the political process. A quick note before we begin, we are, we are offering closed caption through a third party provider this evening. If you don't see it, just click the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and select show subtitles. If you're on a mobile device, you may need to tap the more icon to access it. We almost didn't have this discussion tonight. What has been dubbed critical race theory or CRT wasn't even in the realm of public consciousness until earlier this year. So why give it airtime? Why elevate the discussion of a topic that should be a non-issue? Well, we didn't elevate this. It was elevated for us by extremists who are wielding it like a weapon and using it as a wedge issue to gain political power. The term CRT is everywhere and will continue to be in our media, social circles, legislation, and elections this year and for the foreseeable future, especially as we ramp up for 2022 where congressional, state house, and the governor seats are on the ballot in Kansas. But even now, as candidates are taking pledges and local school boards are being protested, many of us still lack an understanding of what CRT really is. When planning tonight's event, um, I learned that I didn't know enough about it to feel comfortable going into the August primaries where folks will be asked to vote for candidates who are publicly campaigning on the issue. So for tonight's event, we're facing it head on. We hope to have the conversation around CRT that has been missing in our social discourse. We're hearing from all sides, from panelists who don't agree on the topic, but that doesn't mean that we're going to allow shouting and disinformation to prevail. You'll probably hear something that you don't agree with, but I'm asking you to please listen and seek to understand. Seek to find the truth, despite the extreme narratives that surround CRT. Mainstream is grateful for the chance to build our state's capacity to engage in civil discourse. And we're dedicated to facilitating conversations that represent the best of what can happen when diverse Kansas voices come together. This is a complex and controversial issue. So we've invited media and education professionals to join us immediately following this event for their response to what they just heard. It's a way of holding ourselves to a high standard of truth and transparency. And I hope you'll stay with us to hear what they have to say. And now, please welcome to the screen our moderator, Dr. Liz Meidel, Alternative Certification Program Advisor at Kansas City, Kansas Public Schools and a member of the Mainstream Coalition Board of Directors. Hi, I am Liz Meidel and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to serve as the facilitator for this discussion today. I'd like to start by also thanking each of our panelists for joining us and I'd like to thank Michael Popa and the Mainstream staff for all of the work they've done preparing for this event. I'm going to briefly introduce myself and describe my introduction to critical race theory, and then I'll introduce our panelists. After that, we'll move into some opening questions. And my hope is that what will follow will be an informative, respectful conversation, which will serve to strengthen the community of Kansans who have come together today to learn and collectively build our capacity to have civil, thoughtful discourse about critical race theory. My introduction into critical race theory, or I'm gonna call it CRT from now on, happened when I was getting my PhD at KU. I was in a class about the history of education in America, and we were studying the segregation, desegregation, and resegregation of America's public schools. Our professor introduced CRT as a framework that might help us bring order to our research. For instance, one of my central areas of inquiry then and now is why is our teacher workforce so predominantly white and how can we recruit a more diverse crew of folks to work in our schools? It was CRT that helped me to make the connections between the systems of oppression that pushed black teachers out of employment after the Brown v. Board decision and the large scale disenfranchisement with the teaching prof profession that perf persist in many communities. I continue to use CRT as a way of thinking about how to problem solve this perpetual dilemma and others. For me, it is an explanatory tool that I keep in my mental toolbox, snuggled up in there with um, 
feminist theory, uh, behaviorist theory, constructivist theory, and, and lots of others. As I said, I am grateful to be a part of this discussion as I, along with our large audience, deepen my understanding of this tool. Um, as a side note, I want to uh, mention a fun little coincidence. I'm joining this discussion today while on vacation with my family in Wisconsin. And I'm at this super cool little library in uh, near Madison. And the reason that I'm mentioning that is that almost exactly 32 years ago today, the very first academic conference focused on critical race theory happened here in Madison, Wisconsin. And so I got to swing by that spot today with my family. And I'm just getting a huge kick out of the fact that I get to connect with this ongoing academic conversation, both intellectually and physically. And I'm really grateful to share this space with all of these people. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists. I'm gonna read the bios that they provided and I will start with Dr. Chase Billingham. Chase Billingham is an associate professor of sociology at Wichita State University. He specializes in urban sociology and the sociology of education, and his research focuses on urban inequalities, school choice, and racial segregation in schools. His work has been published in leading journals in sociology, urban studies, and education studies, and he is a frequent contributor of commentary for the Wichita Eagle and other news outlets. Denidri Herbert is our next panelist. Denidri Herbert's childhood resembled scenes from Leave It to Beaver, except her mom never wore high heels while vacuuming and her father is black. She is an experienced journalist whose work has appeared in newspapers and magazines around the country, including the Kansas City Star and Budget and Tax News. She co-authored a book about the Brownback tax plan and currently writes for Kansas Policy Institute's online publication, The Sentinel. She once won a competition for being the most average person and is listed in Kevin O'Keefe's book, The Average American, The Search for the Nation's Most Ordinary Citizen. She graduated from Kansas State University with a journalism degree. She and her husband live in Johnson County with a deaf dog named Keller. And our third panelist is Mark McCormick. Mark McCormick is New York Times is an a New York Times bestselling author with 20 years of journalism experience as a reporter, editor, and columnist. He serves as a trustee at the University of Kansas' School of Journalism, and he has been a professional in residence at the University of Oklahoma. He's featured in the Beat Reporting chapter of the journalism textbook, Writing and Reporting News, A Coaching Method. Mr. McCormick won more than 20 industry and community awards, including five gold medals from the Kansas City Press Club. He has been featured in two documentaries and he has his book, Some Were Poppers, Some Were Kings, Dispatched from Kansas, um, and his book, Some Were Poppers, Some Were Kings, Dispatched from Kansas, was Wichita State University's 2020 campus read. In 2020, he was appointed by Kansas Governor Laura Kelly to two commissions, the Kansas African American Affairs Commission and to the Commission on Racial Equality and Justice. Thank you all so much for being here. Now we're going to transition to the question portion of this discussion. We've asked the panelists to keep their responses to the questions into each other to three minutes or less. If you see me signaling like this, it means that our panelists have less than one minute to conclude their thoughts. I'll begin by directing the first question to Mr. McCormick. If you, Mr. McCormick, were explaining CRT to your adult neighbor, how would you describe it? And would your description change if you were then asked to explain it to their 12-year-old daughter or son? Um, I don't think you're gonna have to signal to me uh, about time. Uh, I would say simply that CRT is a reference to a field of study uh, that deals with how uh, issues of race and racism have settled into American institutions. It wouldn't necessarily change uh, how I was describing it uh, to my child or any child. Uh, I think it's pretty much that simple. Okay, great. Dr. Billingham, do you wanna address the same question? Sure, thank you. And, and thanks to you and all the other panelists. And, you know, there's a lot of confusion about critical race theory and 
I think that in part stems from the fact that there's a lot of confusion about the word theory and how it's used in the social sciences. When people hear the word theory, they often think of a cohesive and concise uh, scientific proposition that's been deduced and proven mathematically like the theory of relativity or something like that. But when we use the word theory in social sciences, uh, for instance, in terms like conflict theory or resource mobilization theory or rational choice theory, we're typically talking about a generalized framework of concepts and propositions or more broadly still a school of thought that organizes scholars approaches to given empirical problems. And so it is with critical race theory. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, one of the originators of the term has said as much, she said, critical race theory is not so much a thing, it's a way of looking at a thing, it's a way of looking at race. And so there are many scholars who work in the critical race theory tradition and they're not all going to say the same thing. Uh, but there are a few themes that I think you'll find running through uh, this generalized framework that is described as critical race theory. Uh, first, race is, has been, continues to be a defining feature in American life that structures the life chances of individuals. Uh, in other words, we have not become a post-racial society as some allege, and we probably never will. Uh, second, Racism and racial discrimination continue to adversely affect opportunities for certain groups of people, in particular African Americans, indigenous people, and other people of color. Uh, and third, and I think this is the most important point, uh, racism and racial discrimination are not today, if they ever have been in the past, primarily individual level phenomena, but rather over the course of American history, they've been inscribed into institutions. Uh, as Mark was just saying, they've been codified into laws, organizational practices, entrenched structures in society, so much so that I think uh, critical race theorists would say that even if racism and discrimination ceased to exist in the individual mindsets and actions of individual people, racial inequalities in our society would be likely to persist. Uh, and as such, action toward mitigating or eliminating those inequalities ought to be directed at reforming and restructuring organizations and institutions. Uh, I don't think that I would use the term critical race theory in a conversation with a 12 year old if I were asked to discuss race or racial dynamics or racial inequality uh, any more than I would use the term neoclassical economics if I were asked to talk with a 12 year old about money and trade and business or use the term pluralism if I were asked to talk about issues related to power and government. I mean, these are abstractions. They are theoretical terms that scholars use to organize and contextualize very complicated ideas. Children can handle controversial ideas and they deserve candor and respect from adults, but ideas that are overly abstract don't necessarily help them to understand better. Uh, and they may in fact detract from the ability to reach children uh, if they make kids zone out. Uh, I can speak more if you want about how I would handle that specific conversation with a 12 year old if you want me to, but I think I've already spoken for a long time. So I don't wanna get in the way of others chance to speak. You just match the timer. So good job. Um, <laughs> excellent. Uh, Mrs. Herbert, would you like to address the same question? And I think well, that you dropped off there for a second, but it's the, it, did you catch it? I didn't. I think I know what the question is, but if you would repeat it, I don't want to answer a question you didn't ask, just to be sure. Sure. If you were explaining CRT, your adult neighbor, how would you describe it? And would your description change if you were then asked to explain it to their 12 year old daughter? I don't think it would change because my description would be, I think what everybody's debating about when they talk about CRT, it's like we're talking about two different subjects. I'm talking about in the way I understand this topic as I don't want my children taught in schools using a theory or otherwise that is just informing what they are taught, that they are victims if they are minorities or they're oppressors if they are not minorities. And uh, I think that's basically what real argument is about, but instead there's this gaslighting occurring in which it's, we're not teaching critical race theory and it's just a theory. It's um, as um, one of my friends, he's actually a state representative says, um, Patrick Penn, he serves in the Kansas legislature. He's gonna be um, uh, forwarding legislation to ban it from our schools. But one of the things that he says, how he describes it is, it's not the, if the school were an aquarium, it's not the aquarium it's the air that's being filtered into the aquarium. So it's, it's, it's touching everything. It's in the same way that um, Dr. Billingham talks about it just being a theory that informs. It's a theory that is informing everything that's happening in the classroom in a way that is detrimental in my opinion, in opinion to minority students especially, but it's, it's not helpful to anybody. So let's ask a follow-up from that. I got it. 
get more clever with my timer here. Sorry. That if it's in the air, yeah. How how will Representative Penn's uh, legislation ban it? Well, I think some of um, I haven't actually read his legislation. He's just told me that's something he plans to do. So I don't I don't, I don't want to say what is exactly in it because I don't know. But um, I think you can ban ban some of the principles. Like you you can you can say none of the curriculum will include um, teaching or even training the teachers that black students are automatically victims and white students are automatically um, oppressors. I, this is, I think you can, you can ban that principle or that uh, from, from, from a curriculum. And I think there's also specific curriculum that you, you can ban from schools. And again, I don't know exactly what he's what his bill is, but it could ban 1619 project, or it could ban um, oh deep equity training for teachers. There are different things that you could ban that are very specific, and I'm not sure how specific his legislation is. I haven't seen it, his proposal, but um, you you can ban the principles behind it, remove those from the curriculum, and you can ban specific. Uh, we know which curriculums are include that theory as their basis for how, how they teach history, how they teach everything. Okay, so a follow up to that, and I'll direct this to Mr. McCormick just to keep the, the questions moving around. Sure. Is, well, according to um, Gloria Ladson Billings, who some people will recognize as a, as a scholar who has, who has worked with CRT, um, according to her, critical race theory is based on the idea that racism is normal, not a, a, a aberrant in society. Um, how do you respond to that idea? Um, would you mind if I came back to that question? I don't I just, mind. I wanted to address you something that Demetri said. As you wish. <laughs> I do think that it is possible to talk about what happened to African-Americans in this country without labeling them as victims. Um, and I think that's an erroneous um, idea that is being projected. I would say first that it's my understanding that critical race theory, as you mentioned in your introduction, is a, an idea uh, that is used in law schools and graduate programs, not in public school programs. I also think that in the way that we've been talking about it in popular culture, it's getting conflated with teaching real history. Uh, I think that's problematic. That's probably something um, Dr. Billingham will address. But um, I also don't think it's anti-white. I mean, I took a group of people when I was uh, the executive director of the African American Museum in Wichita, uh, I took a group of uh, people to Alabama uh, to visit the Civil Rights Trail. We went from Birmingham to Montgomery and uh, to Selma. And um, there is a monument there in Selma to a white Universalist Unitarian minister born in Wichita, James Reed. Uh, if you're teaching um, about race and racism, I think you'd also have to teach about the Reverend James Reed, who was killed essentially there in Selma because he was marching with black people. You'd have to talk about Viola Luozo, uh, a white housewife from Detroit who was killed by Klansmen because she was driving people back and forth uh, for voter registrations. I mean, there are all kinds of heroes in Freedom Summer who were black and white. I, I just think it's a scare tactic to try and diminish the need to tell the full history of this country uh, and not hide it from people. I feel like I ought to give uh, Demetri an opportunity to respond to that. I, thank you, I'm, just, I'm assuming I'm not being muted. Um, I don't. I I think that's an unfair um, way to characterize my position. Um, not because I actually want the full history. I want full history taught, but it should include things like um, 
uh, Woodrow Wilson's book on the history um, history of American pe of the American people, and his book is really, in my opinion, what removed Black people who were prior to the release of that book and its kind of adoption throughout society. Black people were our accomplishments and our efforts and the things we had done, even as far back as the Revolutionary War, were a part of our history books. And at some point, people like uh, Chris. I'm going to say his name wrong because I I don't think I've ever heard anybody say it. I've only read it. Crispus Attucks, who was a the one of the first casualties of the Revolutionary War, was a black man fighting on the fighting for. He was an American patriot. I I never heard that room, word in a, that that name in a classroom, and I don't actually fault anybody for not bringing it up. But that's the part of the history that it seems like, in this real history discussion, we want to talk about. Um, Tulsa, but we don't want to talk about about um, his contributions or Phyllis Wheatley. We want to talk about just a very specific subset and time frame, while completely eliminating the role that people like former President Woodrow Wilson had in removing Black people from American history. And I, I it's, it's, I don't want to conflate. I want to teach real history, but I want to teach it, all of it, every, every last bit of it. Well, I'm going to take that discussion that you two just had and, and, and ask Dr. Billingham to weigh in on how, how did the, I mean, you can weigh in on any part of that that you'd like, but the trends that I think Mr. McCormick and Mrs. Herbert are talking about is, is who gets to decide what is real history, maybe, and, and how, maybe if you wanted to, you could weigh in on how the legislature plays a role in that, or maybe not. Where, where are you falling on these topics. Thank you. There's, there is a lot here. Uh, I will say that I <clears throat> personally did learn about Crispus Attucks and Phyllis Wheatley uh, in my school. Um, uh, in, um, to the point that you brought up about, about Gloria Latson Billings, this idea of racism as being normal as a variant in society, I think that's part of what we are, are getting at here. I think that uh, to, to some extent that's certainly true, but we have to be careful about how we deal with a statement like that and we have to avoid uh, speaking in sound bites, I think, because I think that that can be used to ineffective ends, uh, both by people who agree with a statement like that and by those who, who disagree with it. So just to put that statement in context uh, and, and to shine a little bit of light on, on uh, what Mr. Herbert was talking about regarding uh, Woodrow Wilson, for instance, uh, in the past, I would say that racism, the belief that groups of people are superior or inferior based solely upon their racial identity, has both unequivocally declined in recent decades and it's changed in form. Um, explicit outward racism has dropped dramatically uh, as evidenced by responses to the general social survey over time. When people do the general social survey, which is put out every couple of years, when they're asked questions like, uh, do you believe that whites are inherently superior to blacks? Or do you think that the black white wealth gap is caused by innate differences between groups? Or would you object to a member of your family marrying a black person? These are questions that are asked repeatedly in that survey. It's, been, it's become extremely rare for white people to say yes to any of those questions. Old style racist beliefs like that are simply not acceptable in polite society today. Uh, and it's important to acknowledge that. And so it's rare that you, you'll hear ideas like that expressed, but that does not mean that racism has disappeared. Uh, instead, uh, it has largely morphed into other forms which scholars like the sociologist Eduardo Bonilla Silva or Larry Bobo uh, use terms like colorblind racism or racism without racist to describe. Um, so overt racism has largely, although not entirely, disappeared from our society, though we still see unconscious or subtle bias uh, within cases of individual discrimination. But this perspective, which I think is a key tenet of much of what is referred to as critical race theory, emphasizes that, uh, as I was saying earlier, racial disparities, racially discriminatory practices have in many ways become institutionalized, codified. And it's this, what, what scholars sometimes refer to as institutional racism or systemic racism or structural racism, that's what much of the focus of critical work on race is all about. It's not that individual racism doesn't exist, uh, but it certainly has declined. We can certainly say that. But if we want to create a society that is truly racially equitable, we need to be working on systemic changes, changes to laws, bureaucratic practices, corporate policies, rather than simply trying to, as was said earlier, fix the wrong views of individual people, tell people that they are oppressors or tell people that they are victims, which I think is uh, not just less effective on the grand scale, um, but less necessary as individual racism has waned. And I think that that is actually at the core of critical race theory, which again, is a school of thought that began among legal scholars thinking about these uh, structural 
uh, legal issues. You're good at that. You have three seconds left. Um, Can I go back and speak to that? I, yeah, I was just about to say, I'd like to give uh, Mr. McCormick and Mrs. Herbert an opportunity to respond. Mr. McCormick, so, please go first. So years ago, Wichita State had a forum board lecture debate and Alvin Poussant um, was there and he was debating uh, one of the authors of Bell Curve. And um, he mentioned during his presentation um, that there was a push in the late 60s by black psychiatrists to have racism labeled a mental illness. And to the question that you posed to me before um, that I uh, wanted to hold into abeyance uh, until now, um, I found an article that referenced uh, that debate and it said essentially that um, the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, rejected um, that proposal. Um, and it basically said that racism was so widespread that it was a cultural issue, not a psychopathology. Racism is too common, in other words, to be an illness. I would, that would be my response to the, the question that you posed before. It's an interesting perspective and it adds historical context to what we're discussing. Mrs. Herbert, would you like to respond to either that or to what Mr. or Dr. Billingham said? Yes, um, I, I'm not gonna deny that racism exists, but I am going to say, I, I'm not sure navel gazing about it all the time is, is particularly helpful. And I don't, I don't mean that um, disrespectfully. I just mean that one of the things that really bothers me the most um, about critical, this constant discussion about race is this underlying message that, um, that, that brown people in general or minorities somehow need white people to do something so that we can reach our full potential. I need white people in this theory to step aside or change their laws or change systems so that I can reach my full potential. And I'm gonna be honest, and this is my own personal experience. I'm not speaking for anybody else. I don't take this personally, don't need your help. I don't mean that personally. I just mean, I feel fully capable without anybody changing laws or systems to reach my full potential based solely on the how hard I'm willing to work. And, and some of that is, I'm very fortunate I have awesome parents, but um, telling people that they can't, that they need somebody's help, that they need people to step aside, to change laws, to, 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 to destroy systems is, is giving them this image to begin this, this starting point of, I can't do this on my, I need your help. I don't have the ability. It's what George W. Bush called the um, soft bigotry of low expectations. And honestly, when um, Dr. Billingham was talking about how racism has changed and it has, and it has become this soft bigotry of low expectations where there are a, 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 a large contingent of people who look at brown people and literally think we can't get an ID. We can't find the DMV. We, we need somebody to, to, to help us do this. And it's, it's, it's kind of offensive if you really think about it. I am fully capable. And I think we could empower all, all, all people, all Americans, if we kind of gave them some of that message along with maybe we haven't always been perfect, but we're pretty good. And, and you can do anything you set your mind to. Okay, so what you're talking about there is um, meritocracy, right? That, that foundational American value of we have to be able to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and, and make our own way in the world. And so one, a, a question that I'd like to address to everybody is, is, is CRT, is critical race theory so problematic? Is it, has it become the hot button issue that it's become because it pushes back against some of our foundational American values? And, and if so, how do you feel about that? Obviously, Mrs. Herbert, you feel like that particular American value of, of meritocracy and making our own way is, is clashes with ma major tenets of CRT. Um, 
Mr. McCormick, what do you think? Um, well, I, I would say first, it would depend on what you what you meant by a foundational or fundamental value. Um, John Meacham, the uh, Newsweek journalist, says that um, the central tragedy of our country is that we are founded on the idea of equality. And that is an idea that we profess far more often than we practice. That there is a hypocrisy built into, um, built into who we are as Americans. And the difficulty that we're having, uh, just having a simple conversation about this. I mean, I think the opposite is true. I think we need this discussion um, in order to exercise some demons. And until we put all of these questions on the table to be dealt with, um, we're going to remain in this sort of cycle of kind of discussing it, kind of getting angry, kind of retreating to our corners and then coming back and fighting about it again. I don't know if we've ever fully put these questions at the center of a table and discussed it as a nation. Um, when I was uh, at TCAM, the African American Museum, um, we hosted one of Nelson Mandela's jailers. And he talked uh, about the uh, Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission that they had. We really need something along those lines to talk about what happened. I think there are a lot of people who understand that something horrible happened to African Americans in this country, but they're not certain about exactly what happened to them, nor are they, nor are they privy really to the degree to which the government was a part of these horrible things that happened. I think we really need this discussion in order to exercise some demons and um, to gain some understanding about who we are and where we come from. Okay, I, I'm gonna turn that same question over to Dr. Billingham. Do you wanna add to that? And just, yeah. Sure, um, I'm not really comfortable with the structure of that question. Um, I don't think that critical race theory uh, is pushing back against foundational American values. Uh, and I don't think it's problematic personally. Um, this is a country that's always evolving and that's by design. The preamble to the constitution states that the founders main objective was to form a more perfect union, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. And it was a document that made arrangements for amendments that knowing that the country's rules were gonna evolve as the country evolved. That constitution, preserved the institution of slavery and the slave trade. It denied black people citizenship and voting rights. It mandated that black people be counted as three fifths of a person. And all of those provisions either lapsed or they were amended out of the document. The country made progress. Now, some of the most influential thinkers in the critical race theory tradition, people like Derek Bell would tell us that this idea of progress is in many ways a chimera. With the dismantling of Jim Crow, with the civil rights gains of the mid 20th century, we saw, as I said earlier, a massive decline in overt discrimination and racism in this country. But the flip side of that is that racism and discrimination that continue to exist are much more difficult to pinpoint as a result as they occur under the guise of colorblind policies and race neutral language. And it's that very progress that we've made as a country and white Americans constant pursuit of absolution for the, the sin of slavery perpetuated by their ancestors. That makes it hard, uh, as Ms. McCormick was saying, to have a frank discussion about race today. Uh, even an affirmative phrase like Black Lives Matter becomes controversial as critics uh, who espouse this colorblind ideology say that that phrase is divisive and that in America, all lives matter. And so this constant pursuit of progress rather than total equality and the tendency to step back constantly and pat ourselves on the back for all of our progress um, ensures, I think critical race theorists would say, um, that that uh, achievement of total equality is uh, ultimately unachievable. But, and I, I wanna come back for just a second to uh, the 1619 project, which has been at the heart of so much of this controversy over the past couple of years. I think this speaks again to that disconnect between what critical race theory actually is and how it is being caricatured in today's political discourse. Um, Nicole Hannah-Jones in her introductory essay to the 1619 project uh, was writing all about progress. 
You know, the first line of that article said, my dad always flew an American flag in our front yard. That essay is all about the contributions of Black Americans through this country's history that have allowed the country to make that progress towards the ideals that are set forth in the founding documents of the country. Now, the work of Derek Bell and others tells us that uh, we will never have true racial equality in the US, but here's Nicole Hannah-Jones telling us that this country has made enormous progress toward that goal, telling the story of her own lifelong evolution of a spirit of American patriotism, uh, and she's being, being uh, vilified for it. So, you know, debate, discourse, these types of events that we're having right now, a diversity of views, uh, these are really central to what I consider to be American liberty. And in my view, you know, the tradition of critical race theory contributes to that. It doesn't detract from it. It's certainly not antithetical to it. Thank you, Dr. Billingham. What um, I have, I have a follow-up question, but I just, I want to give Ms. Her Mrs. Herbert an opportunity to respond if you'd like. Sure. Uh, well, I just have one quick thought for uh, Mr. McCormick. And the main thing is, I'm curious what, um, what does exercising our demons look like? I, I have a thought of what I think would go to take massive strides in improving. Let's be honest, we're no matter what we do as a society, we are never all going to be equal because we're not, we're all different. And that's not just one of the challenges I have with navel gazing about race, I'll call it that, is that there are all kinds of privilege that you are born with that you, like there's, there's pretty privilege. Man, do you know how many free drinks I could get if I looked like Heidi Klum? Like that's not based on her race, it's just, She's a beautiful woman. That's, so there's all kinds of privilege. There's the privilege of being born into a household with two loving parents who are married to each other. That's a privilege. It gives you an advantage. It gives you an advantage in life. And to just say that race is what is keeping somebody elevating or demoting somebody, I don't think is, is it, it's not an accurate reflection of just being human. But I'm curious what, what Dr. McCormick thinks um, exercising our, our demons look like. To me, the best thing you could do is provide not, not equal outcomes, because I don't think that's possible, but um, equal opportunity. And so I'm curious what that looks like for, for you, Dr. McCormick, since you-, you I would say first that, that, that you're conferring a doctrine on me that I did not oh, own. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> but I will sorry, take sir. I mean, you if, sound, you're, if you're you handing sound, out doctorates, uh, <laughs> I will take one. You sound smart. I'll say second. I'll say second that to to say that to to refer to what I'm talking about as navel gazing uh, is Sorry, denigrating what I'm. It's it's really denigrating um, what I'm what I'm like, talking about. L let me give you an example. Um, I was in an AP history course in high school. And I remember some of my classmates, I was the only African-American in there. I remember my classmates joking that there were no African-Americans until the 1950s. I just remember recoiling uh, at that, but not really saying anything. Some of these kids had known me for years, uh, since grade school. They had to have known that my parents came from an all black town, uh, that Booker T. Washington visited and lauded for its industriousness. They had to have known at some point uh, that my mother's picture hung in the hallway downstairs. She was a 1945 graduate of that high school. And in that era, the school officials didn't want black kids and white kids in the same water. So black kids could only swim on Friday. The pool was drained, cleaned over the weekend and then refilled with water because they didn't want the kids in the same water. We know from the Brown decision, which is one of the top five decisions handed down by the Supreme Court, that that kind of segregation that was imposed on people did something to a child's psyche. You remember the doll, um, the, the, uh, the doll test where kids were saying, um, that doll that I said is dumb and as ugly as the one that looks like me. These are the kinds of systems that Dr. Billingham is talking about. These are the kinds of systems that have not been deconstructed. These are the kinds of systems that we have not even fully discussed. I'm saying we have to discuss things and any 
therapist worth their salt will tell you that silence is toxic to relationships. And whenever someone wants to bring up this issue, people who don't have to deal with race uh, have all these issues with having the discussion. Um, that's really the big problem that uh, John Stewart said a few years ago, if you're tired of hearing about it, imagine what it's like living with it. Though that's what I mean when I say we have some real demons to exercise that I, I have always felt like if the majority of the country just had a whiff of what it was like to live as an African-American in this country, they wouldn't want anyone else to experience that. That's some of the hard work that we have ahead of us. So what does that look like on the other end of it? So, so when, when this, after this conversation, what, what's, what's different then than what, what, what's different than, than today? What, what, what does that look like on the other side of it? You're asking for a prescription before we did any diagnosis. I guess, I guess the, I'm, I'm asking for that because I don't, I'm, I, at this point, all we can do is commit to the conversation. Okay. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, one of my favorite sayings gonna, is that we is don't it, arrive at truth until suffering speaks. And African Americans have suffered mightily in this country. And yet their mouths have been covered when it was time to have these discussions. And they're often covered by the kind of situational outrage that we see. ta Coates says that modern racism isn't, as Dr. Billingham was talking about before, these overt ex uh, expressions. It's more about um, broad sympathy for some, broad skepticism for others. So there's horrible outrage at Colin Kaepernick for kneeling, but dead silence when patriots Go to the go to the Capitol and urinate and defecate in the hallway. These are the kinds of discussions that we have to have in our country if we're ever going to get well. I'll just say this last point. So I was watching 60 Minutes a week or two ago, and the documentary filmmaker Ken Burns was on there, and he was talking about being a small child in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in 1965 sitting at his mother's bedside as she died of cancer. He said he could hear the television in the next room where the news coverage was about Selma, Alabama and the beatings on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And he said he couldn't separate then or later the cancer that killed his mother and the cancer that was killing his country. If we don't deal with this, this cancer is gonna eat us from the inside out. That's the point I was making. Okay, that's, this is excellent conversation. I'm going to, I'm going to take a step from where you were to, to the future of our country and how we deal with racism and loop it back to critical race theory, which isn't in and of itself an answer to that question, but could be, I think a lot of people would say could be a tool us to use as we have those discussions. Um, it's, and, and this is a question that um, I had already planned, but I think it's relevant to what the discussion you two are having. Um, Su uh, Dr. Suvini Anima, who teaches at Stanford, she suggested recently that critical race theorists attempt to use their perspective to make sense of America's failure to make good on the promise of the civil rights reforms of the 1960s, which is where we all know that's where critical race theory started. It was with folks in the late 70s and 80s wrestling with why did the reforms of the civil rights era fail? And, and what I think the conversation you two are having is that Mr. McCormick is saying they, they have failed. We haven't, we haven't really won the battles that we were fighting during the civil rights era. And I think if I hear Mrs. Herbert right, she's saying that we have to some degree won. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Billingham to weigh in on that question and then I'll invite both of you to join. Is the question, have we won or not won? Uh, or I guess, yeah, in terms of the reforms of the civil rights era, the promise, the hope of the civil rights era, have those hopes been realized or not? And if so, what 
if so, or if not, what role does critical race theory have in, in helping us address those? Uh, no, they certainly have, have not, although that's not to deny the immense progress that was made. Um, Mr. McCormick mentioned the Brown v. Board decision, which was a monumental decision in, in the history of Ameri the American Civil Rights Movement. Uh, but as you mentioned, um, the legal tradition of critical race theory was largely born out of looking at that decision, specifically the Brown v. Board decision, and then looking at uh, statistics on racial segregation in schools in the decades that followed. And what we see uh, to the present day is that our schools remain uh, immensely segregated and that um, following uh, Brown II and a series of other uh, court cases, the failure to implement active desegregation strategies within our schools allowed uh, the, the aspirational rhetoric that, that we saw surrounding the original Brown decision um, uh, petering out a little bit. You know, we saw significant progress uh, toward racial integration in our schools, but that has largely faded in the ensuing decades, and particularly with the Supreme Court decision in, in parents involved uh, in the previous decade, what we saw is uh, really a, a complete retreat from the goal to, uh, to integrate our schools, to have racial integration in our schools. Uh, and that's not to say that we haven't made progress in other ways in our schools, but that specific goal uh, has largely been abandoned. Um, and the hope for integration in our schools, just to keep going with this example, has largely fallen toward, uh, in recent policy discussions, um, hopes that empowering parents to choose schools for their kids will yield uh, greater integration in schools through um, tools like magnet schools, for instance. And while there have been some selected uh, successes there, what we see in the aggregate when we continue to study racial segregation in schools, uh, as I do, is that we see that patterns of racial segregation both within individual school districts and especially between districts, that is between um, urban school districts and their surrounding suburban school districts, uh, th those levels of segregation continue to be extremely high. So uh, while I, I would never be one to deny the the reality of progress that has been made in this country. I don't think that um, we have achieved all of the, the goals that the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century set out to achieve. And the question of uh, what can critical race theory contribute to that? Was that, was that the second part of your question? Uh, is critical race theory uh, a tool for addressing that? Uh, I absolutely think that it is. It's certainly not the only tool, uh, but I think that uh, as Mr. McCormick was saying, um, sitting down and having frank discussions that sometimes do make people feel uncomfortable uh, is useful for thinking about strategies for moving forward. Okay, thanks. Mrs. Herbert, would you like to tackle that? Sure. Uh, I, I don't actually think the, the, the civil rights movement is, is, is one, but I definitely don't think it's lost either. All, all things are a, a process and, and take ev everything in life takes, takes time and this kind of thing takes takes decades and maybe even generations. And I personally think we should. I, I'm I'm a half I'm a glass half full, full person. I do think we should celebrate how far we've come and and appreciate it. I I just that's that's really it. I just I don't I don't think all is lost. And I I'll be honest, I don't have any anger about racism in our country. I don't like it. I don't think it's okay, but I'm not mad about it. It doesn't, it doesn't fill me with anger. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't even know. I don't even need to talk about it 99% of the time because it's not, and, and maybe I'm just very fortunate, but I, it's not a, it's not a thing in my life. It's not a daily thing. It's not a monthly thing. It's maybe every three years something happens and I'm annoyed and I roll my eyes and then I move on. And I, that's that's my personality, I suspect. Okay, that, thank you for that. Mr. McCormick, do you wanna address the same question? Sure. I have um, a follow-up too, so if you don't wanna address it, we can sure. No, I, I, I did. Um, you know, like Denidri, I, I wanna be a prisoner of hope also, but, um, you know, Malcolm X said, you don't plunge a nine inch knife in my back, pull it out six inches and call it progress. Um, back in 2014, uh, during the 60th anniversary of the Brown decision, there was a, uh, 
there was a lecture series at the University of Kansas. I actually took my son with me and he got to take his, pic his picture with um, um, Linda Brown, who was there with her mom, actually. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a great experience. And one of the things that I've learned was uh, I met some of the Virginia litigants. 75% um, uh, of the litigants in the Brown decision were from Virginia. These were black people who did not want integration. They were terrified of integration. What they wanted was the equal that was promised in the separate but equal. They were terrified to, to integrate. Um, that was always fascinating to me. And the speaker who spoke right after the panel that had the Virginia litigants uh, was a history professor from Ohio State named Hassan Kwame Jeffries. And he argues that we underestimated the resolve of the modern day uh, white nationalist to keep schools segregated, uh, to keep society the way it was, and it has not been sufficiently studied. Um, a lot of people from the movement, and this is from Eyes on the Prize, said they got what they wanted, which was a modicum of integration, but lost a lot of what they had, nor did they get to exactly where they wanted. Um, I think a lot of work remains to be done and we have to start rethinking a lot of these issues and rethinking um, how we arrive at the kind of America um, that Denidri was talking about, where people have equal opportunity. I think that um, we've used the words equal and, and uh, oh, we've used a couple of words a lot. What we're, but we, what I'm interested in now is talking about the difference between equal or equality and equity, because I think that also goes back to what um, part of this conversation is. Didn't, Mrs. Herbert said a couple of times that we're not going to have equal outcomes, um, and that we can't. You know, privilege is something that can be conferred upon an individual through the luck of genetics or, or good fortune. Um, CRT is primarily concerned with equity over equality. So um, let's just do the same order we just did. And, and I'm interested in hearing what you have to say about if, if, we, if we ban CRT from schools, for instance, or if we, if we demonize CRT as a, as a topic of conversation, are we also, are we degrading our ability to talk about equity and equitable legal educational um, healthcare, all of those institutions that run our lives, are we, are we holding ourselves back from having equity conversations about those things? Um, Dr. Billingham, would you like to go first? Sure, and uh, Mrs. Herbert brought up a really important distinction, the distinction between equality of outcome and equality of opportunity, which I think is an important thing to have in conversation when we're talking about uh, what you call equality versus equity. And um, I think that what critical race theorists would uh, say is not that equality of outcome is not desirable. I think many of them actually would espouse that, uh, but that we are in a system today in the post-civil rights era where we simply still do not have equality of opportunity. And to go back to you know, the, your, your original question about how can you talk about this with uh, a young person in a school to, to come back to the question that you were just asking, how, could we, how would we incorporate that into uh, school? You know, one of the, the most salient examples of the legacy of historical discrimination that remains with us today is the institutional discrimination that took place in the housing market uh, a century ago, right? And children can, you know, children can handle complicated ideas. Children can perceive the phenotypical differences between different groups of people that we refer to as race. They can observe in the segregated society that we continue to live in, that people that tend to look one way tend to live in one part of town, people that tend to look another way tend to look, live in another part of town, and they may wonder why that is. And you as an adult or as a teacher, you don't need to go into some long abstract discourse about colonial theory or uh, present this esoteric lecture on the history of the homeowners loan corporation or the housing act of 1949. But what you can say is that through the mid 20th century, there were laws in this country official policies of banks, 
insurance firms and other, com and other companies, legally sanctioned private practices that limited where black people could live in this country and that made it harder for them on average to buy homes than it was for white people. And that while most of those policies and practices have been discontinued or drastically scaled back today, the legacy of them remains today. And since home equity is the single greatest source of wealth for most people in this country, those historical disparities have been carried forward today and continue to contribute to the differences that you as a 12 year old are, are seeing around you. And that's an argument that has ties to a critical race theory tradition. But as with so many other things, it's, it's more relatable, more understandable, I think for a child and for an adult, if it's more direct, more specific, and they can see it with their own eyes and relate it to their own lived experience. And to get back to that question of equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome, what that historical legacy uh, demonstrates is that today what we see is a vast and continuing black white wealth gap that limits the opportunity uh, systematically of African-Americans vis-a-vis uh, their white peers. And a lot of that has historical roots in institutional practices. So I think that that's where a lens derived from uh, critical race theory can help us to think critically about that distinction between equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. So Mrs. Herbert, it, I'll pass to you. Do you want, you can address the equality issue, the equity issue or the history of, of, of real estate and redlining and the GI Bill and all that that entails, whatever, whatever works for you here. It's funny, it's, it, it's um, throughout this discussion, a lot of um, what we've been talking about, I have been thinking, this all comes down to, to, to zoning almost. Um, if we're, we're talking about um, segregation in schools, um, well, segregated schools, and they are largely segregated, but that's, that's more a function of zip code than, than, than anything else. And that, I, I'll be honest, I'm a school choice advocate. Um, I, 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 because I think, I think actually, even where critical race theory is concerned, parents should be able to decide whether they want a school that is pumping critical race theory in into the oxygen in the classroom. I think parents should, should have that choice. And I do think it would desegregate somewhat. I don't think it would, but you run into, um, as Doc, Mr. McCormick was talking earlier, um, some people do choose very intentionally to segregate themselves. Um, when I was a college student a long time ago, um, I ate dinner at the dormitory hall with the people who lived on my floor. And across the street from me, across the hall from me, there was another girl who was mixed race. And she would always sit at um, a table, the table of African-Americans who all sat together. And she asked me one day, how come you don't come sit with us, you know, your, your people at this table? And I asked her the same question. Why didn't why don't you come sit with us? We're your, we're your people too. We the, our whole hallway went to lunch together every, every day, and I think that's somewhat what we might run into. It yes, old zoning laws, yes, old banking laws, yes, all all of those things are are true, and I'm not denying any of them. I guess my question would be, how do you fix them beyond how they've been fixed at the moment? other than providing equal opportunity at the elementary, education is obviously the key. How, how do you do that when you have these zip codes that are based on um, income and, and don't give parents the opportunity to move their kids? Mr. McCormick, I'm gonna pass same question on to you. Um. You know, I thought um, Dr. Billingham spelled it out really well. Um, we need to be clear talking about equality here. Um, African Americans were systematically, by letter of the law, left out of various aspects um, of home ownership. Uh, as, um, as the doctor just pointed out, um, that built enormous wealth that created uh, an American middle class. Um, you can't compare that to someone sitting by themselves uh, 
in a, in a cafeteria. Um, I am upset about this. I am upset when people are um, the victims of injustice, where people aren't treated fairly. Um, and I feel like any right-minded American ought to be offended by that notion as well. Um, it is a part of who we are supposed to be if we are Christian people, what you do to the least of these. Um, that doesn't seem to apply though, if you have Melanie. Um, James Baldwin, one of our greatest writers and thinkers said to be black and relatively conscious in this society is to be in a rage almost all of the time. If we're not serious, if we're, if we're not feeling in our guts, the kinds of injustices that people who are our neighbors, friends, and fellow citizens uh, are experiencing, I really have to question our sense of, of righteousness that we seem to wrap ourselves in all the time. This should be issue one uh, on all of our um, priority lists. Uh, dealing with these issues. If we're going to have a just society, uh, we can't just profess this, as John Meacham says, we need to practice uh, who we, we need to be, uh, who we say we are. And as Dr. King said, we need to be true to who we said we are on paper. Thank you for that. That we have time, I think, for one more round of questions and then one wrap up conclusion round. Um, so for those of you who are in the audience, what we're going to, we at 7.15, we are switching from this panel to the follow-up panel. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to give everybody a chance to offer up whatever concluding thoughts they have. My final, oh, I just timed myself right out of talking. Um, my final question, though, is, is, is related to one of the things that is happening in in some of our Kansas communities right now in terms of politics. Lots of our school board races have become about critical race theory, which is, it, you know, the, the, the conversation, as we've mentioned a couple of times, it kind of came out of nowhere. And then all of a sudden we have, we have politicians talking about it with, with potentially large scale implications for, for our children. So my question is, do you think that folks who have anchored their political interest in CRT, for instance, school board candidates, have a viable platform for long-term policy decisions? And um, how does a pro or anti-CRT perspective impact other aspects of a person's political identity? And um, I think this order has been working for us. So I'm just gonna ask Dr. Billingham to go first. Sure, thank you. Um, I think that I would uh, disagree with a little bit with Michael Popa here. I don't get the sense that this is going to be an issue that stays with us uh, and is used the way that it's being used right now as a political cudgel for, for much longer. You know, politics moves pretty fast and issues that are brought up as culture war wedge issues tend to be supplanted by new culture war wedge issues when the previous culture war wedge issue has stopped uh, inflaming the, the passions of the electorate as effectively as it had previously. Uh, you know, political candidates that are running on this issue right now are sometimes making audacious claims about how critical race theory is infiltrating elementary school classrooms and how they will work if elected to remove critical race theory and the 1619 project in particular from classrooms. Um, there, there is some truth to the idea, as was mentioned earlier, that uh, ideas deriving from critical race theory uh, are being um, put into some school curricula. Uh, there are people who, who deny that it's there altogether. I don't think that that's true. I do think in general that you see it more frequently in uh, kind of elite private K through 12 schools than you do in public schools, at least uh, as I've seen so far. Um, but so there, there's some truth to those claims about the, the teaching of, of these ideas in elementary schools, but there's really a lot of hyperbole. Uh, so I think that this is going to be resolved in uh, one of a few ways. Uh, first, either opponents of critical race theory are going to succeed in these races, and they're going to succeed in efforts to suppress any curricular content with any connection to critical race theory. I think that would be a very troubling development, but it's possible. Um, or alternatively, 
proponents of critical race theory could succeed in pushing back on that type of censorship and, and implement maybe a wider deployment of that type of curriculum. Uh, but I think what's most likely is that the issue is going to cease to be as salient as it is today. We're going to see much less shouting about it as people move on to another issue, especially after the 2022 election. Uh, what ultimately happens, I think, is probably going to vary by jurisdiction. Uh, and I think that you'll likely see uh, all three of those outcomes take place in different places in this very diverse country of ours. But I think that that third resolution um, is likely to be the most likely outcome in the long run. Thank you, Mrs. Herbert. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, the first part of your question, no, I don't think this is a long-term, I, I can't remember exactly how you phrased it, but no, this is this is a topic du jour and next week, next year, definitely by 2020, January, 2023, it's, it's probably gone. However, I do think that it could bear fruit um, politically uh, down the down the line, just because I do think this has been a successful wedge issue, and I suspect that there will be several candidates who take over school boards, and their terms are going to outlast that deadline of when this this ends. And and they probably are more conservative politically if they are campaigning on an anti CRT um, platform. So that that's likely to bear some fruit down down line. Um, that will probably make me very happy. Um, but the one thing I really do hope that it, it does do is I think for the first time in a very long time, and this isn't just CRT, it's, it's COVID, it's all the things that have happened in the last um, year and a half. I think people are paying more attention to what happens at their school districts and what school boards are doing. And I think that is so important. I think for a long time, parents have just kind of said, oh, the local school district is great, everything's great that bad stuff that happens in that one school on the news, none of that stuff happens in my district. And now they're, they're watching and I, I hope they, they stay there and pay attention. Okay, Mr. McCormick. Um, this is almost like asking um, about negative campaign ads. You know, you know, do I think negative campaign ads are, are gonna be around? Um, I think they're gonna be around because they work. I think people understand how voters think. And because they understand how voters think, they keep using it because it works. Um, to me, um, critical race theory, which I should reiterate, um, is not taught in elementary schools. It's the law school and graduate school uh, theory used with, with folks like that. Um, this is a scare tactic. This is Robert Preston, the music man coming to River City, trying to get people to buy uh, uniforms and instruments for a band they don't need. This is Willie Horton. Um, this is the Carr Brothers. Uh, this is Welfare Queens. This is the same kind of uh, kind of dirty politics that we've seen for quite a while. Um, as a topic, I'm not sure it'll be around, but these kinds of politics will be around. So on that um, note, I'm gonna invite all of you to uh, give us whatever closing comments you'd like. And, but before you do that, I do wanna say thank you so much. I've actually found this to be an enlightening and fascinating conversation. And I'm um, really looking forward to going back and getting to enjoy it without worrying about my timer. So uh, when, when I do that, I'm sure I will find um, even more kind of enlightenment and, and thought provoking, uh, compelling opportunities to rethink some things. So I appreciate all of you and your time and your insights and your honesty. So uh, in the same order that we've been going, Dr. Billingham, do you have any closing thoughts for us? Yeah, and thank you all. Uh, it was really great to speak with all of you tonight. I really appreciate being included. Um, I guess my closing thought would be that I think that we should trust our teachers, our educators. Uh, I think that they do a great job and that they um, really are putting in a good faith effort to give our kids uh, the best educational experience they can possibly have. You know, I think that elementary and secondary school curriculum for public schools should be created by professional educators working in conjunction with the Federal Department of Education, State Board of Education, local school boards, and have input from the public, from parents, from other interested parties. I think the public scrutiny of K-12 curriculum is acceptable, uh, is important, it's good. 
especially when it comes to controversial subjects like this, but where governmental authorities step in and say that certain ideas, certain ways of preventing ideas to our children are forbidden or cannot be spoken about. Um, I think that not only does that have a chilling effect on teachers, uh, but I also think it just has the potential to create bureaucratic headaches for schools and teachers as they try to figure out, you know, how can they teach about restricted ideas to their students? Am I allowed to mention the history of slavery to my students? Am I going to get in trouble for how I present it to my, to my students? So I think that public input into curricular issues is healthy on this and other topics, but I think in general we should defer to our educators, to our school boards, and really trust that they really are typically working in, in good faith to, to create the best uh, educational experience for our kids. Thanks again. Thank you, sir. Mrs. Herbert, would you have any closing thoughts for us? Sure. Um, one thing that I've heard um, maybe both Mr. McCormick and Dr. Billingham talk about is um, colorblindness as a, as, a, as a bad thing. And I know I got protested not that long ago in McPherson in which I, somebody I was with actually uh, said, I aspire to, to live as Martin Luther King would have us judging people by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. And um, I, one of the things that bothers me about CRT a little bit is I feel like it is replacing the idea of, of colorblindness. I think it's a worthy goal to, to, for people to, to strive to be colorblind. When somebody meets me for the first time, I fully expect them to judge me based on things I, I can't control or even things that I can control, like my halfway funky glasses. However, I hope that after they've met me once or twice, they know me as Denidri and not black person, white person, mixed person. They just, they know me as an individual. And so I think there's value in, um, in, in striving for a colorblind society, even though I know that is not well thought of at this time, but I, I value it, it greatly. I want, I want to be judged for, for more than the color of my skin and things I have no control over. Thank you for that. Mr. McCormick, do you have closing thoughts? Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, most of us are familiar with um, Jane Elliott's uh, blue eye, brown eye experiment that she did with her Iowa school children. And um, all of the lessons that come from that and she replicated that on Oprah's show once where, you know, there were guests coming on. I mean, not guests, but a uh, audience members coming through and she had them separated and people were just furious in the audience. But um, what stuck out to me uh, about the experiment uh, were her comments about um, the test scores of the kids who were in the groups, uh, in the out group. She said the kids who were in the out group, the kids who didn't have any privileges for the day, their test scores plummeted from one day's exposure to this kind of treatment. And she asked, what must this do to a child who has to live this way for a lifetime? This is not um, about people feeling helpless. This is, a not, this is not about people being victims. This is about systems of oppression this is about processes that we have to dismantle. And these, again, are conversations that we absolutely must have. So I would commend uh, you, Liz, for being such a great moderator today, uh, for Mainstream, for having this um, event, uh, for Dr. Billingham, for Denidri. Um, um, we, don't, we didn't agree, but I did enjoy this conversation. And we ought to have more of these, I think. Um, we learn so much more uh, when we challenge each other's ideas instead of just nodding. So uh, I appreciate uh, everybody's contributions tonight. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was a wonderful closing note and I will now turn it over to the executive director of Mainstream Coalition, Mr. Michael Boba. Thank you, Liz. And thank you so much to our guests. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, I wanna echo Mr. McCormick's sentiments that this was a, a very enlightening conversation and I appreciate all your thoughts and perspectives. And um, Liz, I appreciate you uh, keeping the conversation moving forward. A recording of tonight's event will be available on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. So I encourage you to go view it again later and then share it with your friends and family. 
Thank you so much to our members and event attendees, over 275 of whom registered for this event. Without your support, Mainstream Coalition and our affiliate, the Voter Network, would not be able to do the work we do. Uh, please stay with us for the second part of the event to hear the reactions from our media and educational professionals. But first, remember, all elections matter. This year is especially important because municipal elections often go unnoticed and voter turnout is particularly low. Mainstream is working hard to bring attention to this year's elections and the important issues surrounding them by providing you several opportunities like this, like this to engage with candidates and voters. Mainstream Coalition, the League of Women Voters of Johnson County and other partner organizations recently co-hosted primary candidate forums in Lenexa, Olathe, Overland Park, and Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. You can view those recordings on our YouTube channel. Main PAC, our political action committee, has published our ratings for candidates going into the August 3rd primaries. And for the first time, we've published the candidates' complete responses so that you have all the information that you need to make an informed decision at the ballot box. And then our affiliate organization, the Voter Network, provides a nonpartisan comprehensive voting resource center at ksballot.org. It's the widest reaching ballot guide in the state and the only one that allows candidates to add video content. Visit ksballot.org and enter your address to find information about upcoming election dates, which races are on your ballot, where to vote. Uh, you can sign up for voting reminders and, of course, learn more about the candidates on your specific ballot. This nonpartisan resource is also available in Spanish at ksboleta.org. And finally, for our August monthly event, we will be looking at how outside interests and money influences Kansas politics, with a specific eye on the 2021 Kansas races and state legislation. Members will receive priority registration, so make sure that your membership is up to date by visiting our website at mainstreamcoalition.org. And if you aren't already a member, please join tonight at mainstreamcoalition.org. For just $35, you get all the benefits of membership, including priority registration to events like these, legislative updates, and more. 